Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. And every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by the headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. We've got a really nice session lined up for you today. Um, our first speaker actually comes very close to home. He's a grad student right here at the DGP at U of T, where it's a beautiful day outside in Toronto right now, in case you wanted to come for a visit. Um, Let's see, he's worked at What a Digital, so he's got that real life industry experience, and his work deals with something that's a huge problem for character animators, faces. Um, we all have them, maybe we take them for granted, but when's the last time you really thought about how you move your face? Um, I know when I was reading his paper, I couldn't help but try to control different aspects of it, like winking at my camera or at my, <laughs> at my laptop or you know, wincing and smacking my lips, I don't know. But if you, if you think about it, there's not that many motions we can do, but each one of them has a huge series of tiny little details. And the, the, really the, 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 de the important part is in these details because that lets you distinguish between people and personalities. And, it can, and ultimately, how do you tell and quantify how you're moving your face? Maybe to you, it doesn't matter, but to a character animator at Disney or any sort of a graphic studio, um, a good control interface can make the difference between an hour of work and a full week of work. I really love these types of graphics problems because sometimes their solutions might feel um, subjective and maybe the question they're asking is ill-posed, but ultimately we need to think about the, these large generalizable solutions to these ill-posed problems. Please welcome uh, Junho Kim. Hello, uh, thanks for inviting me out. Yeah, my name is Junho Kim, and I'll share my screen before people yell at me. So let's, uh, let's start from the beginning. Cool. So uh, this is a paper I submitted to SIGGRAPH 2021 last year called Optimizing UI Layouts for Deformable Face Rig Manipulation. Basically saying, how do we, can we, can we generate um, a UI layout that controls a face um, automatically with some design decisions. So let me introduce this field to you guys who might not really see this much. So character interfaces for animation studios, um, very important to have something that actually feels nice to use, feels comfortable to control. And um, on the very top left is this slider catalog box. And that's how that's what's default given in Maya software to control different parameters of the face. So the parameters, if you activate the parameter to like a value of one, then maybe it'll deform your eyelid or your arm or twist your hand, something like that. So we have to figure out, um, is there a more intuitive way to actually use this in our workflow? And artists create these all these rigs that take a lot of time to actually um, create and there's a lot of human error that may be involved with trying to kind of like connecting a bunch of wires to a bunch of different wires by hand and it's just a very tedious process um, but the payoff is definitely there for um, rather than using some very uh, old style window interface up there so um, so let's look at the problem so basically the problem is um, it's a layout mapping problem where um, I want to map control rig parameters, which are these deformations of your model, to a set of vertices that are on the face. So maybe for my eyelid, if I have a parameter that closes my eyelid, then maybe I would want to have my UI control where my eyelid is. So we're trying to optimize for, we're trying to um, find this mapping of which vertex should this control rig be associated with. And then we can create the UI element that controls that rig or that parameter, and we can anchor it to that vertex that was selected. So in the right example here, for this eyelid example, um, we would select a vertex that's very close to the eyelid. 
that we like physically you can just move your iwid and that's where you would move your iwid and then you can put your ui element on that um, vertex so to actually go with this problem to actually look into this problem we thought about um the main thing is like the arrangement of these ui elements on the face but after studying some different ui element or ui control rigs that people have actually created we came up with some design objectives that we want to try to um, implement in an optimization problem. So what are some design decisions that we would like to have for our UI elements? So the first thing is we want our UI elements to be big. We want them to be um, big enough where we can actually control them with some ease. So if we have like this cheek um, inwards, um, control, we wouldn't want to have a small slider. We want something that's big enough so that our mouse or our pen can actually control it very easily. So we want something with a lot of displacement. Um, we also want to not have these UI elements overlap easily. So we want them to be easily accessible and clickable to a user for a user rather than having to kind of zoom in and try to pick out which UI element that you want. Uh, we also want these UI elements to be visible to the user, obviously, so trying to put them in front of the face rather than in vertices that are maybe inwards. For a lot of models, there are vertexes that are in, inside the actual model. Um, for symmetric elements, so there are a lot of UI element or UI control parameters that um, actually come in pairs. So you can think of like the right eyelid or the left eyelid. You can think of the right cheek or the left cheek. So they come in pairs. And for any user who's controlling the face, you would expect that these UI elements to be symmetric on the face instead of being one, maybe one is here and then another one is here. That doesn't really make sense for a user. So we want to make them symmetric along some plane of symmetry. We also have deformations that displace or displace um, symmetric vertices along the face. So for your forehead, hopefully your forehead, um, it moves, the vertices are symmetric in this movement or your jaw also moves symmetrically along this plane of axis. So we want to maybe have these UI elements just be somewhere in the center of those displacements. And the last one's not so super common, but there are some parameters that deform the entire face. So maybe if you're moving from a male to a female, or if you're manipul like you're turning a cat into a dog, these are global deformations. Um, so then we try to create a separate control element for that. So now we'll go quickly into this overview of the pipeline of what's going on. So. Um, I'll, I'll go through each of these individually. So the first part is we have our input, obviously, which is the model and the rig parameters. And we're trying to get an output of which rig parameters should be associated with which vertices. And then using those vertices, what can we place the UI elements on that vertex that controls that rig parameter? So a lot of this problem or this, this work was actually focused on pre-processing of the vertices because these models have maybe thousands or tens of thousands of vertices to work with. Industrial rigs might have the upper tens to hundreds of different rig parameters. And for our optimization later, which is a quadratic programming problem, um, the, the more vertices and the more rig parameters you have, it's going to, the problem's gonna grow exponentially. So we want to try to get rid of a lot of the vertices as much as possible before we feed it into our optimization. And so the first thing that we do is there's a lot of vertices that actually don't move with the deformation. So we can just completely prune those out because you're not gonna put a UI element that doesn't move on that vertex, right? So we prune a lot of these vertices. Then there are a set of vertices or there are a set of control rigs that actually come, that can be joined together and form one UI element. So a big example of this is maybe um, there's like a lip pucker um, maybe the corner of the lip, you want the lip to either go up or down. So you can imagine having just one UI element that controls the lip up or down rather than having two separate controls. 
for clustering, um, then with these groups of parameters, we can kind of cluster them to feed it into our optimization. So the UI elements that are placed on the upper half of my face might not necessarily influence the locations of those in the lower half of the face. So we can separate those. And then for downsampling within the groups, um, it doesn't really matter if the 2000th vertice or the 2001st vertice is used for a UI element. It just matters if it's relatively close to its deformation area. So we can downsample a lot of these vertices and have a good approximation of where our UI elements can be. And then we feed each of these groups into a optimization or a solver and the results of previous locations feed into the next problem as constraint locations. Um, so I'll go over this real quick. So the problem that we're looking at is an uh, integer quadratic programming problem with a quadratic term and then a, um, a linear term. The main thing is that we have this, we want to optimize for this x, um, ver this x vector, which is actually, we can say this x matrix. And this x matrix um, is a n by n binary matrix where n is the number of vertices and m is the number of rig parameters. And each element in this matrix tells us whether the nth rig parameter will be anchored to the nth vertex. So this is going to be a very sparse matrix of ones. And so, um, so some terms that we're actually using in as energies is D is basically, you can say like the size of the UI element. So we want to have optimized for UI elements that are big. Um, then we also want to optimize for um, the spacing between UI elements here. So this was done using, basically we take two pair of UI elements and calculate this inner element distance sum. Um, so then, and then we feed this distance um, sum into this, you can say like this negative sigmoid function that penalizes closeness of UI elements and likes the, the distance between UI elements. Um, and then there's a term for balancing, which is the lambda right there. And basically you want to kind of tweak the balancing of the size of these UI elements and the distance between these UI elements. Um, and the constraints are just making sure that um, the, the X matrix or X vector is um, proper. And then quickly, I just wanna go over some results. So all oh, the other ones not rotating, but these are some results of what our op, um, optimization gave us. So we can see that um, depending on how we move, um, how we balance stuff, um, the UI elements are pretty spaced out. They're in locations where we would expect them to actually um, um, deform the the particular part of the face. So in the video on the left, you can see the UI elements. They also move along with the face. Um, so it's more of like a direct manipulation field that's very nice for um, artists. And you can see there are some elements up in the in the eyelet or the eyebrows that are that have joined from the actual pre-processing step. So then the timings, um, definitely it saves a lot of time optimizing this because you know these rigs can take maybe a whole day or a whole week of work with a lot of like debugging. So um, we ran this on a very pretty old hardware and it's giving us very quick results in the actual optimization. For some limitations and future works. So the limitations obviously for very, very high industrial rigs they have over like hundreds or maybe thousands of parameters. I think like the new Woody and Toys story has like over a thousand parameters or tens of thousands of parameters. And it's just a lot to deal with. And these are very minute, um, small changes in the face. So they actually do create UI, very short UI elements given the way we formulated the problem. So that's a big problem. And um, one way to solve it might be to actually um, figure out how to cluster the, the, the controls to, to um, better to create a more coarse deformation UI element. Or, but then the question is like, what, does, what do these actual UI elements look like in higher dimensions? And so 
uh, one example of a future work could be this definitely this formulation definitely extends to manipulations of the body itself. So you can try to run this on deformations of the arm or the hand, but then those introduce other problems like um, we're using more of a linear deformation systems, but or deformation parameters, but there might be rotational parameters like the rotating of the hand. How does that UI element actually look like? How do you measure distance with that? So those are some other works or problems. And um, very quickly, I just want to give credits to the asset providers, animators, participants using the user study. And this is uh, animation by um, our very own Chris Landreth in the in the in the lab, and he made it very nice. Made the UI look a lot prettier than pink and pink and green. And he put it on his own rig, and he said it felt very much like better than using those other sliders. And it was very quick. But yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you for letting me um, share this work with you guys. Thank you so much, Junho. Um, I'm excited to get the chance to talk to you more about this at the Q and A session after the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the YouTube comment section or in the uh, YouTube chat section. Now, I'm really excited for this next talk as well. This is a professor from Harvard University, and her research really cradles that sweet spot between physics, material science, and geometry. Um, their lab basically just takes all the coolest stuff that I learned about in my geometry class or my thermodynamics class, things that maybe we would have taken for granted, like maybe a theory or an instability we learn about. And then you try to make use of that instability or use of that uh, understanding to design a real life thing that moves or that is controllable. And what I really appreciate about these structures that I see coming out of her work is that I don't usually associate things like this with a high tech robot. If I think about what a high tech robot is to me, I just think of this big machine with arms and metallic legs that, I don't know, cooks you dinner and waves hello and carries your groceries. And it has all these gadgets and compartments and tools that you just keep adding on and on and on to. And I, I think when I look at her work, I think the mechanisms and motions are, are a lot more inter intimately intertwined with the limits, not of like how, how well we can engineer things, but how, we can, how well we can understand the underlying physics underneath them. Um, and they show that we can achieve a rich range of controllable motions by delving into, you know, math instead of just adding another arm or control element or joint. Please welcome Professor Katja Bertoldi. Thanks, Adnan. Thanks for the introduction. Let me share screen. All right. You should be able to see my presentation now in presentation mode, right? Good. All right, so thanks for the introduction. Thanks everyone to be, uh, to be here, to join us. So, and today I will tell you about a few studies we have recently been working on, on a multi-stable structure. And pretty much in this talk, we'll be talking about geometry and the how we can explore geometry to get interesting behavior. Very and we try to keep the geometry fairly simple. Specifically, today we look at multi-stable structure. So, but the structure we have been looking at, those are elastic structure. And here you can see an example of an elastic structure. And typically, you know, when we deform an elastic structure, what we notice is as soon as we remove the load, they go back to the initial configuration, right? This is how elastic structure typically behave. And here you can see an example, this structure is made of elastomeric rubber. Now, why is this? Well, you know, the force displacement curve of this structure might be highly nonlinear. As for the structure you were uh, looking at, in this case, there is an instability. So you see there is a plateau in the force displacement curve. But the energy landscape is characterized by a single minimum. So it means as soon as you remove the law, you go back to the minimum. However, what has been known in the physics and mechanics community for a long time is that you can also, if you carefully design the geometry, you can also realize structure that by sna might snap between two stable configurations. And here you can see an example, this thin shell that has a dome shape. You see we are poking it, it's, it's basically inverse, and then it stays there. It's not snapping back, it's not coming back. And so you retain the shape after unloading. And this has been known for a long time and has been studied by the physics community, by the mechanics community, and the emphasis has been on understanding why I mean, the geometry leading to this property. 
And by the way, why do we why do we retain the this uh, the full configuration after we remove the loading? Is because in this case the shape is that that it leads to energy landscape with two minima. So we have multiple stable configurations. So for a long time, the scientific community has been focusing on which geometry does lead to this multi-well energy landscape. But in recent years, multi-stability has also emerged as a platform to realize a smart structure. And here you can see three examples, tunable optics, shape changes, and even simple machines that are able to move. And my lab has been thinking along this line. So the work I reported here is from different groups, Chiara D'Araio, Doug Holmes, and Lorenzo Valli. But my group has also been thinking along this line. And today I want to present three projects that exploit multi-stability as a platform to achieve functionality. So the first project will look at multi-stable inflatable origami at the middle scale. Then to realize deployable structure, then we look at multi-stable structure as a platform to realize simple robotic arms that are capable of um, different deformation modes. And finally, we look at how we can also embed multi-stability in fabrics, ideally to realize wearable multi-stable system. All right. Let's start looking into the um, deployable structure. So on the first project, I want to focus on deployable structures. So what are deployable structures? These are structures that are a compact shape that is ideal for uh, storage and transportation, and then can be deployed for functionality. And uh, the project I'm gonna present was led by my postdoc, former postdoc Ben, former student David, and it's a collaboration with Chuck Coverman, who's at the Graduate School of Design here at Harvard. And so if you think of the feature that we want in our deployable structure, where we want to occupy the minimum volume possible when folded, we want to provide a robust environment, a protective environment. So we want to pro provide a robust shell. We want to lock in place after the deployment. And then we want to be as easy as possible to deploy. And clearly, many strategies have been proposed to realize the deployable structure. And here in this nice picture, the picture on the background, you can see one of them. So these are linkage-based structures. And you know, we use this system every time we go camping, right? Our camping tent are sort of based on this uh, uh, linkage-based system. And these are good, but you know, we have also been exploring alternative uh, platform to realize these deployable structures. Specifically, they have been looking at origami as a platform to realize multi-stable structures and deployable structures. So why origami? Well, first of all, it's well known that origami can be folded, right? So it can largely change the volume. They can go from a compass shape to an expanded shape. And another interesting feature is origami intrinsically provides a robust shell because the system comprises of hinges, folds, and uh, faces. So the faces might prov provide a, you know, have the potential to provide a close environment. Further, what is also being shown is that by carefully designing the crease pattern, you can also realize multi-stable origami system. So, and this is good to lock the system in place after deployment. Then how about deployment? We want the deployment to as easy as possible. So as you can see in all the animation running here, there are fingers. So the way we interact with origami is typically through our hands. So these structures are challenging to actuate. And when you try to actuate with our hand, then you end up with a lot of tubes, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture here. So how can we simplify the equation? Here our inspiration comes from uh, inflatable structure. So if here you can see this picture, two commercial available inflatable structure. And what is interesting, fascinating about this system is a very easy to deploy. So we connect a pressure source and they come out. And um, this is uh, attractive. However, this structure comes also with limitation because as soon as you remove the pressure input, they collapse. And so this is why, you know, this is just a simplification. So, so what happened here, the pressure drop, this is to the France 2016. And there was a pressure drop, and you see that the inflatable structure collapsed. And now let me try to get the volume down. OK. And why is this? Well, because the structure are monostable. So they have a single energy minimum. So as soon as you remove the load, they go back to the initial deflated configuration suddenly. So how can we remove this limitation? How can we overcome this limitation? Well, our idea is can we engineer 
can we engineer an inflatable structure with an energy landscape that is characterized by multiple minima? So can we engineer a multi-stable inflatable structure? And to engineer such inflatable structure, we want to use origami as a plastic. All right, so how do we engineer our multi-stable inflatable origami structure? Our building block is very simple triangle. ABC at the vertices, alpha and beta at the thermal angle. On the bottom, you can see the X view, and on the top, a 3D view, three dimensional view of our triangle. Now, what we can take, we can take this triangle and create a simple and create an inflatable cavity, right? In this case, what we do, we arrange the triangle next to each other to create a sort of a star like shape, and then we put two layers on top of each other. All good. Now we need to deploy the structure. So to deploy the structure, we rotate the triangle BC, the triangle around this HBC. And, and now, you know, this little deployment of the structure. However, we have a problem. So what's the problem? So as soon as we, rotate, we deploy the triangle, the angle alpha is not recovered on the XY plane. And this means that any de these deploy configuration are in geometrically incompatible. And here the incompatibility is represented by this red region. What it means is the triangle are going to separate or are going to overlap. And we can also quantify this geometric incompatibility. Now, are all deploy configuration incompatible? So, well, what we would like to get is a so the question I'm asking is, is it possible also to have a deploy compatible configuration where the triangle are next to each other and there are no opening and not overlap? Well, the, a very simple theorem that we all study in high school, the inscribed angle theorem, tell us that this is possible. So because if you choose beta carefully within the range that you can see here, what the inscribed the, the angle theorem tell us is that basically we can find another, the, the triangle, that uh, with the same HBC that basically uh, intersect the same circle circumscribed to the initial triangle. And this means that the angle alpha is recovered in the XY plane. So it means that we are able to achieve a deploy compatible, directly compatible configuration. And so why is this important? Well, this is the basis to form a stable structure. Because if now, if I'm going to the lab and realize the structure, the material I'm gonna use, I'm gonna be able to be formed in some way. And so what now I expect is that this incompatible configuration that they are separating these two geometrically compatible structures to be, the geometric compatibility to be absorbed, to cause the formation in the structure to be absorbed by the formability of the material that I use to realize. And this will lead to an energy barrier separating and at the two minima, separating the two geometrically compatible configuration. Now let's try to study a bit better this deployment. So let's focus on a specific triangle. They choose alpha 30 degree, beta 33 degree. And now what I'm plotting here is a geometric incompatibility as a function of the deployment height for this triangle. And what I see is that as we deploy the triangle, the geometric incompatibility increase, reach a maximum and then sudden decrease. And so I have an expanded compatible, uh, geometric compatible configuration. Now the question is, are we able to reach, can we reach this, uh, deploy, this expanded uh, compatible configuration by inflation? So what I can do also, I can also calculate the volume underneath the triangle. And now I, I can plot it and this is the dashed line as a function of deployment line. And now here, what we see is the maximum volume is, occurs before the expanded geometric uh, compatible configuration. So, this means that I will never be able to reach the, um, the expanded configuration by inflation. And so here is pretty much a demonstration of that. So here you see the structure and you see that it's by stable. You see we pull it up and it remains there, right? And now we are trying to reach this uh, stable configuration, expanded configuration by inflation. And you see that we are not able to reach it because we reach the maximum volume and then we stop there. There is no way we can reach this. Okay. So is this the end of the story? Well, let's try with a different triangle. So the dark blue triangle here, I've modified beta to 33 degrees and increased to 50 degrees. So now what we see is that in this case, the maximum volume configuration is after the expanded deploy, uh, the geometric compatible expanded configuration. So this structure can be inflated, but what we see is that the incompatibility is very low. So there is low incompatibility. 
So now it's still here, they are against the wall. Either we can realize structures that have high incompatibility but are not inflatable, or structures that are inflatable but are low geometric incompatibility. And I expect low geometric compatibility to translate into a marginally bistable structure. So what can we do? Well, what can we try? What we try is to combine two different triangles to realize this structure. And the first thing we can try to do is combine two different triangles, so light pink and dark pink, to form again this star structure, star-like structure. And now all here, all the analysis is based on geometry, right? So we can easily characterize the behavior of many, many structures and characterize the maximum compatibility and the inflation and the inflatability of the structure. And so here, what I'm reporting on the vertical, this plot of the vertical axis, the maximum compatibility. On the horizontal axis, inflation constraint. I don't, go, I'm, don't want to go into the detail, but pretty much it characterizes the distance between the maximum volume and the expanded compatible configuration. And what we want to, to be, in, in order to be inflatable, we want to be on the right of this vertical axis. So we want to be above zero. So what I see is the larger is the inflation constraint, the smaller is the maximum compatibility. And so now what we can do, we can pick the design with the large, the inflatable design with the largest maximum compatibility. So design A, go to the lab, fabricate it, and see whether it's by stable. So here is the prototype. It's realized the phase are still printed, the hinges are basically a TPU membrane. And now what we're going to do in our experiment, we inflate it. So, and then we remove the input. So the cavity now goes to atmospheric pressure, and then we see what happened. In this case, we see immediately it goes down to the initial flat configuration. During the test, we also monitor the pressure. We have a pressure sensor. And what we see is a monotonic behavior. So there are no signs of bicellular. What else can we do? Well, the next step we try is to basically arrange a triangle, connecting the shorter edge of one triangle to the longer edge of the, next tri the other triangle. And so what we see is this list of structures with largest the larger maximum compatibility. Again, we take structure B, that is the design, the inflatable design with the largest maximum compatibility within this family. We go to the lab and we fabricate it. And so we test it. And so now we're inflating. And then at this point, we disconnect. Now the current is at the atmospheric pressure. We see that it remains in the deployed configuration. So this structure, this design is by stable. And when we look at the PV curve here on the right, we see that it is monotonic and characterized by an area of negative pressure. And this is indication of bistability. All right, so now we got star-like shapes that are bistable. Are we limited to this specific shape? Well, next, what we can do, we can try to connect the triangle in a different way. So instead of next to each other, we can put on top of each other to create this wedge-type structure. And then when we go and test them, we see, in this case, we even get larger maximum compatibility. And we see that we can get design with a regional negative pressure, so design that are by state. So for this, in this case, so so far we have been able to write structure that go from flat configuration to an expanded stable configuration. But we are not limited with that. We can also realize structure that go from one expanded shape to another stable expanded shape. And this is because we can we can we can think of the initial flat uh, triangle as the projection of an initially rotated triangle. And now I'll spare you all the geometry, all the detail are in the paper. But what we can show is that in this case, we have an additional parameter that is the initial orientation, the initial rotation of the triangle. And by playing with this parameter, we can realize structures that are bistable and inflatable out of a single triangle. And we can see that the structure have a quite large geometric incompatibility. And when we go and realize and test them, we can see that also these are largely bistable because they have an area of negative. All right. So, so far, what I show you is that by, guided by intuition, we have been building different building blocks, different family design family, basically four, and three out of these four are, can be bistable and inflatable. But now the question is, you know, at the beginning, I promise, functional, I promise you functional design. So how do we go from this building block to functional structure? Well, one possibility is to combine different building blocks together. And so, for example, we can focus on design three, Pick two building blocks that are, that are multi bistable and inflatable and connect them to form a, deploy, uh, a deployable arch. And so here is what we build. Let's see. Yes. So now this is large, larger than the sample I showed you before. It's at the submeter scale. 
and it's made of um, corrugated plastic. And so now we inflate it. Now we remove the load, this important point. So now the internal cavity is most very pressure, and you see that remains up. This is different from the inflatable arch that I showed you at the beginning at the to the front that collapsed. And now, if you want to, you know, move it around, and we want to, we can fold it back by applying vacuum. What else can we do? Well, we can also combine elements of two different designs to create a functional structure. So to design our shelter, what we use, we use a layer of design one to create the floor and a layer of design four to uh, define the livable space. Now, this is a collaboration with the graduate school of design. So we want the, our shelter also to look nice, to look nice. And so we also apply some uh, trimming operation and so we stack several of these triangles on top of each other to make it look nice, but doesn't even change really the physics. And so at the end of the day, what we end up, we end up with a structure that is flat. And what we want, we want to inflate it, we want to deploy. And then the key point is we want to open the door and we want the structure to remain in the deployed configuration. Let's see if we were able to achieve that. So here you see David and Ben in the gym. So now they are connecting the pressure. So they are pressurizing. And you see that the structure is deploying. So you see it's opening up. And now the roof is going to pop up. So the structure is now deployed. And now this is the key test, right? We are opening the door. And we see that the structure remains in the deployed configuration. This means our structure is bistable. And then uh, when we want to move it around, we want to move it somewhere else, we can simply connect to vacuum. And we can collapse it back. And now the structure is ready to go. And pretty much here is where we are with this project. So what we have done, we have demonstrated that by using simple origami idea and we use simple geometry idea, we have been able to realize structures that are origami-based structures that are deployable and inflatable, deployable through inflation, and that can be, I mean. And you know, the concept in principle is based on geometry, right? So it's still independent. So we can fabricate a small sample in the desktop sample in the lab, but we can also fabricate meter scale structure. All right, so time to move to the second project I want to talk and discuss today that is about using multi stable origami building block to realize structure that support multimodal deformation. And here, really, the inspiration comes from soft machines, soft robots. So these are simple machines that in recent years gain a lot of attention because of they are inexpensive, easy to fabricate. And on top of that, they are very suitable to interact with the human body and with delicate objects, as you can see here in the gripper, right, that pick up eggs. And you know, in the last few years, great progress, a lot of progress has been done there, but clearly there are still challenges. And in particular here, I want to focus on one of these challenges. So here, what you see is a very popular bending actuator, a bellow actuator. It's one of the most popular soft uh, actuators. And it's good, you see it's bending a lot, it's flexible, it's easy to fabricate, but there is also a limitation. So this, this actuator is only capable of bending. So by controlling pressure, I can control the amount of bending, but there is no way I can make it twist, I can make it to simply elongate. And this is because here I have an intrinsic one-to-one -one relationship between input pressure and output pressure. And so now the question we are asking is, can we overcome this limitation? Can we realize the inflatable structure capable of supporting multiple deformation modes when actuated with a single pressure input? So I want, basically I want to get a structure that with, when actuated with a single input pressure, can bend, but can also twist and maybe can simply elongate in that for, when, by tuning the input. So how do we go about this? So the project I'm gonna present is done, recent work done by my former postdoc Antonio, now he's a faculty at, uh, in uh, London, University of London. David, former student David, will soon start as an independent faculty in, um, at uh, Columbia University. And then at Concordia University, sorry, and Ben is now a faculty at Leuven University in Berlin. So here our starting point is a Kreslin module. It's a very popular and you know, simple origami module. And now with, in this case, we 3D printed the module and now we inflate it, we actuate it by inflation. And you see that when we actuate, when we inflating, it's basically deploying, so it's unfolding, it's twisting and elongating, and then we basically, we are deflating, is collapsing now. 
So this is any by the way is monostable. As soon as we remove the input pressure, it goes down. So now we want to basically play with multi stability again. So we need to make this we what we want to turn, we want this turn this Kresny model into multi stable surface. To do that, what we do, we take a panel and we further triangulate to form a dome, a four uh, order vertex. And then what we see when we do that, we see now we are inflating at a certain point critical pressure. We see that this modified panel snap out. And now what we see that when we deflate, it remains in the snap configuration. And this break, uh, there is a uh, rotational symmetry, and it leads to some bend, as you can see here. And then if we further deflate, it's not, eventually it's not back, and then the module completely falls. So here now you see we have two states as zero when all the panels are folded inward, and then we have a state as one when the modified panel is pointing out, is folded outward. And then this upon deflation leads to some bending because one panel is outward, all the other wants to basically collapse and it leads to some bending. And now the interesting point is that we can control the pressure pressure at which the panel snap and snap back by changing the location of the central vertex of the modified panel. And we denote with delta the position of the vertex. And so we see that by increasing the, 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 this delta, we can increase the pressure at, uh, required to snap and snap back to this panel. That's good. So now we have a library of building blocks. So we have a building block that can be made by stable by introducing a modified panel and by tuning the position of this vertex. So by varying delta, here we we'll look at three values, two millimeter, three millimeter, and four millimeter, we can vary the pressure at which this panel is not, is not done. We can also vary the chirality of the model and the module, and we can also vary the position of the modified panel on the, on the structure. And so now with this library, we can start, we can, what we can do, we can start stack, to stack this module to form, to form simple tubular structure. And here you can see the simple structure we can think of. We are only stuck in two modules. And we choose a model with that type of two millimeter, one with that type of four. In the first case, structure one, the, the modified model are on top of each other. In the other structure, they're opposite to each other, one on the left, one on the right. Now, what we expect both structures to have the same state diagram. So we expect both structures to have the same, will have the same activation pressure and the same deactivation pressure, at which the two modules get activated, so it's not, and deactivated, there's no back. However, what we expect is the deformation associated to these two structures to be very different. So this is structure one, the modified model on top of each other. And now what we are doing, we are inflating to basically snap the bottom module. And now we are deflating. And when we deflate, what we see is the bottom module um, bend, the top one simply fold. And now if we further deflate, both of them fall back. And now what we can do, we can further, if we further increase the pressure, now both modules snap. So when we deflate, now we see that the structure bend, both module bend, so we get quite a bit of bending. And now if we further deflate, now, what we see is that eventually both modules snap back, most modified panels snap back, and the structure goes back to the original. How about the second structure? We are inflating. So the first, we are only snapping the bottom module. So when we deploy, we get the, the top one twist and the bottom one bend, same as before. But now, what we are done, we are going to Activate both modules, so we want to increase the pressure upon inflation. So both modules narrow snap. And now when we deflate, we see that they're a very different, both of them bend. As a result, what we get, we get a twist and domi twisting dominated deformation. So very different deformation. And so here are snapshots extracted from the movie. So what we see is now by controlling the pressure, we can get complex deformation in this case. And we can go from a simple linear motion to a bending dominated type of deformation and a twisting dominated type of So now the, quest, the first question is how can we quantify this deformation? So what we do is in our experiment, we, we monitor the vector connected the, connecting the centroids of the top and bottom cap. And then what we can do, we can look at the magnitude, we can look at the angle, then this vector for with the xy plane, theta xy, and this gives us a measure of twist. And we can look at the angle that this vector for with the xz direction, the, uh, uh, the z direction, the xz plane, 
theta xz, and this gives us a measure of the um, bending. And then what we can do here, basically, you know, we are in this polar plot, we report both the theta xy, so the twisting angle, and the theta xz on the bottom, so the bending angle, for all these different um, complex deformation modes that we are able to assess by controlling the pressure. So this here we have been looking at two structures, but the design space is very large. And what we can do, we can study many, many units, and we can vary the position of the modified model, we can vary the delta for each model. And so really to explore the type of deformation that we can access with this platform, we need a numerical model. And the model we built is very simple, it's purely based in geometry. So first, what we did, we, we tested individual modules. And then during the test, we measured the amount of extension, the amount of uh, twist, the amount of bending. And now what we can do is step two, we can assume pressure continuity when stacking this model on top of each other and use this data measure on a single module to predict the deformation of a structure comprising n units. So is this model good? So now on this polar plot on the right, I'm comparing experiment, the field marker with numerics, these are the empty marker, and we see that the model does a good job. And here is also visually, you can see that the model, comparing more visually model and prototype and, and sample, and we can see a good match. So now what we can do, so now we have this model, we can go and try to explore the design space. And here, what I'm plotting is the location of the top cap for all structure I can build using four units, stacking four units. So and you can see that, you know, the cap span quite a bit of a space. And now each structure, um, each structure basically has different deformation mode. And so for each structure, I have multiple markers in this plot, right? Because here I'm reporting all possible deformation modes for all possible structures. And so, for example, I can now I can go into the database and look at the structure whose mode complex deformation mode are further apart. And uh, these are the specific marker for this structure. And here are the same marker in the, in the power plot. And now here on the bottom, we can see the top of the formation mode that we can get. And some of them, we can bend in different direction, twisting dominated mode. And the variety of the mode that we achieve is even more apparent and more evident when we look at structure with 12 cups. And so now you can see that we can span a larger area. And now here again, I'm, I'm look, we are looking at the structure whose mode are further apart. And now you can see that we get more in which the structure bend in different direction. We get more bending dominated mode and twisting dominated mode. And we can, we can push this further now and think about an inverse design and what the play the can be place to say, okay, now we have three targets that we want to reach. Can we identify a structure that is able to reach these three targets? And so, you know, we can run our geometric model and for the specific three targets, what we find is that a structure with 12 building blocks is the one that minimizes the error and, uh, and is able to basically get closer to this three target. And now here you can see the specific structure identified. And so now what the model tells us in order to reach the first target, we need to inflate above as, as you know, until before and then deflate. And now what we see is also if we want to reach the other two target, we need first to reset the structure and then to deflate. And in this case, we inflate more and then deflate to get to 23. And now here you can see the structure. So first we activate the structure and now we are gonna deflate. And now we see that we are gonna get T1. Now, if you want to reach T2, what we need to do is first reset the structure. So to basically deflate or deactivate the model that activate, have been activated. And now what we're gonna do, inflate more to activate more of all the modules and now deflate. And in deflation, we are gonna get each first T2. And then if we deflate even more, so we snap back to more element, we get each three, and then we go back to the initial three. And so pretty much a series where we are. And now, you know, if you want to think about applying the structure for robotic application, what we would like to do is try to instead, in this, in this case, to, get, to reach a three target, we have, we, we have to reset the structure. So now we will loop this continuous loop. So to be able to go from T1 to T3. And this is something we basically what we, are, we can do is start constraint to the optimization algorithm. And then we can think about using this as a platform for simple robotic structure. All right, so let's see. We have, yeah, we have a few more minutes. And in these few more minutes, what I would like to do is go over a very recent project. This is pretty much what I'm going to present now is working project. 
And it's, you know, what we are trying to do now is embed multi-stability into wearable textiles. So in all the structure I saw you before, you know, we're made of rigid panels connected by deformable folds. And uh, a year ago, when Kausaya joined my group, you know, there were a lot of discussion about and a lot of projects focused on bike stable structure. And she is passionate about knitting. And she started, and you know, she told me, you know, Katia, what I can do. I can try to make a but I, what I would like to do. I would like to make a multi-stable knit, a multi-stable fabric. She went off, and after a couple of months, she came back to me with this. So here what you see is a fabric that she made in the house I need. And initially you see there are folds all vertical. And now, you know, she's pulling on it with her hands. And you see that she is transforming the vertical fold into this horizontal fold. And this fold remained there. She removed it. The, even when she removed the hands are there. And now, you know, if you want to go back to the vertical fold, what you have to do is to stretch the fabric in the other direction. And you see that now she's transforming the horizontal fold back to vertical fold, and it remains in the vertical fold, the fold remaining vertical. All right, so what is the magic? What's happening to it? So first of all, how did Causalia make this sample? Well, she used a knitting machine. Specifically, she used a knitter rail. That is a sort of a new concept. So it's a sort of a 3D printer for uh, knitting. And you know, the components are the same as traditional knitting machine, but the interesting part is we interact with the machine, the interface of the machine using Python. And then what uh, Causalia did, she basically used the machine to fabricate two very, the, two very basic stitches that are the, are the building block for the multi-stable structure. One is the garter stitch, and the other is the rib stitch. And now here you can see two pictures of the stitches. And they are both the direction of manufacturing of these two pieces of textile are the same. So the direction of manufacture is the one vertical. And in one case, what you see, you get horizontal fold. In the other case, you get vertical. And this is because during the knitting process, somehow the knitting process introduces an internal curvature that in one case leads to horizontal folds, in the other case, vertical folds. And now the idea that Causal had is how about if we combine these two stitches? And so, and this is specifically the unit cell that you see. So you see we have orange and blue here corresponding to different stitches. And now, you know, we create a unit cell. And now what we can do, we can basically tessellate it to form our fabric. And so basically what we do, we combine fold in both directions. And this is the, you know, the sample that we get. And now what we can do, we can pull on the sample. And when we pull on the sample, now you know instead we have a vertical fold, and we can see that what we can do, we can transform this vertical fold in an horizontal fold. And we see that you know it remains there, the horizontal fold. And when we, we can do that in an in the actual testing device, and now what we see is that this transformation from vertical to horizontal comes together with a drop, drop, a, a sharp drop in fold. And at that point, you know, you, you remember also when I was showing at the very beginning, you were looking at the origami structure, the PV curve of the structure had a certain drop. So this drop are associated to multi stability. So, but if this is, you know, geometry here again plays an important, uh, an important uh, role. So in this case, you see that we see when we maximize the orange. So now in this case, you see it's sort of unbalanced. Here we, there is a lot of orange, little green. And when we test, we stretch, but then you see it immediately, it's not by stable, right? As soon as we release it, it goes back to the configuration. And the same for the opposite. Here in this uh, sample that you see on the right, you see that we have, oh, the movie unfortunately doesn't play. Okay, now it plays. We see that we have a lot of green and tiny orange. And you see that as soon as we remove the load, it goes back to the And so in order to get by stability, we, did, we need to get, a balanced amount of green and orange. And when we are balanced, this is the sample I showed you before. Now here the movie doesn't want to play, but it doesn't matter much because you remember we get this nice by stable structure. And now you know we can go and uh, and we can go and explore the design space and we can vary the geometric parameter and we can see by varying the geometric parameter. We can get drops of, we can, can control the drops. And when we see large drop, it means it might be stable. When we see a small drop, it means it's more stable. And now, what we are also trying to do, we can also, we are basically trying to develop and come up with a numerical model to 
to simulate the structure. And so this will help also with the design of more so complicated, more complex geometry that are by, by stable. And so what we do in our job, first of all, we use continuum and we use finite element and we use continuum as shell element. And to mimic the curvature that is uh, induced by the knitting process, what we use, we use a tree. So we basically use standard expansion of two layer, layer, layer shell. And I'm sorry, but the movie here doesn't play, unfortunately. Let me try to go out of the presentation mode and see whether it can play. Here we go. Yes. So, so you can see that basically what we use, we use temperature to induce the initial, uh, to basically form the folds. And this is just a trick, a sort of a trick. And then, you know, and then what we can do, so we introduce basically a thermal expansion, of, we associate a coefficient thermal expansion to the two layer. And this is a fitting parameter, but basically we can fit it to the cross section of our uh, samples. And then what we can do as a second step, let me try to see if I can go again the information in uh, presentation mode. And then we can apply a load. And you know, in the second step, and then we see that there were samples now. So by applying a load, you know, we get this transformation for vertical fold, horizontal fold. And when we look at the energy landscape, we see that this list comes with a second energy limit. That's good. So this is indication by stability. And again, you know, we can also compare to the cross section of our sample and we can see a good map. So here is pretty much where we are with the model. And now the idea is to use this model to go and explore the design space further. And now, I mean, another direction we are exploring is application. Now we have this wearable by stable property. So what can we do with them? So what we try to do is for, to create, first step is to create wearable switches. So what we can do, we can introduce some conductive knit, some conductive yarn, sorry, into the knitting specific region. And now what we have is a, a switch. So basically, you know, when we snap, the you so we basically now the the vertical fold we transform to horizontal fold they get in touch and then they our lead we create a contact and our lead is going to switch on so what we have we have a switch now this is nice but you know typically the way we interact with switches is by pushing and so what we are here what we are exploring we are also exploring different geometric configurations in this case you see now we are we are pushing down we have a conductive layer beneath, underneath, and so we're pushing. It's again, it's a stable structure in the down configuration, and now you see we are switching on, and then we can simply switching off when we push it down. And so pretty much here is where we are. This is really work in progress. We are working both in exploring more geometry that of needs that are bistable, and on the other hand, we're also exploring functionality. So now we have these switches. Can we integrate into wearable, you know, into our sweatshirt? to create add functionality to our sweatshirt. And so pretty much this brings me to the conclusion. So I hope I convince you that by playing with geometry, we can realize by stable element that, you know, can, uh, with, that can bring in new modes of functionality. And specifically, I've been looking at, we've been looking at by three examples, the product structure, robotic system, and wearable and programmable needs. And if you're interested in more detail about the project I presented, so one paper is out, the other paper uh, hopefully will be out soon, and the needs is work in progress. All right, so that's pretty much the end of my talk. Thank, thank you. So, thank you so much, Professor, for that really interesting talk. Um, we have so many questions. We know that you might have to leave soon. Uh, do, so we could we start? I have, uh, yeah, I have 10 more minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, let's start out with some questions. I'm, we're really, we're interested in knowing more about the details of the inverse design problems that you use for your multi-stable states. The reason we're interested in that is usually when we try to find, oh, um, we want to minimize an energy, we try to make that energy as quadratic as possible so that there's only one local, so that yeah. there's only one minimum. And so when you have uh, a, such a multi-stable system as you showed in your entire talk, what sort of optimization scheme do you expect would work? And what did you get? Do you know what you guys used in that in the video? Yeah, that you yeah, yeah. So no, that's just an excellent question. Yeah. As you mentioned, right, when we optimization for linear system is a very well established, right? When you have a linear system, you can even do topology optimization, right? 
I mean, I can even, uh, there are tools to identify even how the structure should be connected, right? And basically for my, I can just provide as an input a square block of material and the algorithm tell me where to arrange the material. But the interesting part, the tricky part, the even interesting part, is here we are dealing with highly nonlinear system, right? The energy is not quadratic, there are multiple wells. And that is where we are struggling and where I think there are plenty of opportunities and where we need your help. So just to make it clear, I was trying as a structure, I was trained as a structural engineer. So we are very. So, okay, for the first problem, the origami problem, there we would like to do the three questions. So far, the shame came up, we were guided by intuition. You know, I mean, we figure it out, we try and, uh, try and error, let's put it in these terms. But clearly, it would be nice to have a model, right? So I, it would be nice to have an optimization tool that tells me, okay, if I want to have this initial shape and this final shape, this is the way I should arrange the question. I have no idea how to do it. And if you have any, because, but I would like to do that at least by preserving a multi well energy landscape. That's the tricky part, right? I mean, there is well, I mean, you know, there are tools in the origami community to go from shape A to shape B. You know, the you know, origamizer, there are tools like that, well established. But the point is, I want to preserve a nonlinear energy, a multi, an energy landscape with two wells. And this, yeah, where I mean, I, if some of your idea is interesting, I would love to talk more about it. Mm -hmm. The second okay. project, we did an optimization. It's a discrete, okay, that is a bit easier because you know we have a discrete set of elements, right? We say, okay, these are the module, it's a discrete problem. So then you can use discrete uh, uh, gradient-free, forget about gradient, because you know. So basically stochastic, gradient free optimization. And you know, there are a bunch of different, uh, disc in the, our case it's discrete because then we have poor value of delta. Discrete, uh, basically stochastic optimization. They are slow, they take forever. Can we do something smarter? That would be nice. So what we did, we did the, you know, just use a stochastic uh, evolutionary uh, discrete optimization. I specifically we use the one implemented in MATLAB, it's called GR search, something like that. I see. Nothing fancy, nothing fancy. I see. Interesting. And we also use a simple grid of, um, yeah. But nothing yeah. fancy. It's really interesting to see this problem pop up in, uh, in this field as well. Um, or I have, but we I have... would say in general, optimization of this structure is perceived as the next, you know, what needs to be done, right? Because so far is all is guided by intuition. There are efforts, I mean, we also have done some effort recently using machine learning. I mean, there are opportunities, you know, is the best solution, who knows? So, but I mean, I would say it's a topic of interest in the community and a topic where there is space, a lot of open space, let's put it in this term. I see, I see. Cool. Well, thank you very much for that answer. Oh, uh, I have a few more questions for Jun Ho. We're gonna do a, a little back and forth. Um, so after listening to Katya's talk, it, made, it got me thinking about how people play around with rigs, character rigs, uh, either in faces or bodies or whole things. And usually you just take your parameter and you can just slide it wherever you want. Um, I was wondering, are there certain like low, can we think of certain low energy modes for where these sliders should be? What, what I mean is maybe an eye doesn't like to be halfway between open and closed. Maybe it likes to be fully open and fully closed. And so maybe your UI element should be pushing it a little bit closer towards one of those states. Do you think that's annoying for artists or do you think that would be useful? Um, yeah. Um, so I think, in theory, it sounds like a good idea, but I do think that unintended behaviors for for any UI element that an artist works with is very not pleasant. They definitely would prefer, or I get, maybe I guess for maybe like children or beginner artists or people who aren't trying to have so much control, um, having assistance with like low energy, like maybe pushing towards more closed or open is would be a behavior that they like, but for many of these artists, they actually want the full control. So having something that if they expect it to be like halfway open, but then it suddenly pushes more towards one extreme or the other, that would be something that would they would definitely not like, so. Yeah, okay, but, that makes sense. Uh, can I ask a question, Yohu? So how about <laughs> making this tool available to engineers? 
So specifically, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for example, right now, I mean, I'm collaborating with uh, Conor Walsh, wearable robot. And now we need to put a shirt on top, I mean, to simulate a shirt on top of a body. And the point is, how do we arrange the shirt? And clearly there, there is, it looks like, but we also need, we know that it's, you know, we need to minimize energy. So do you think it's something that you could possibly, I don't know, adapt your method to? Mm. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear all with that yeah. outside. <laughs> so, uh, for example, right now we are working on a problem where we need to simulate wearable actuators using finite elements. Mm -hmm. And so the point is these actuators come with a shirt. So we need to take a shirt, we have a model of a 3D body in finite element, and we need to take the shirt and fit it to this body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm wondering whether your tool somehow could help there. And it's something we are thinking of now, and we don't have the solution. Hmm. Um, I'm actually not too sure because. So, are you asking for whether I, I couldn't get the last part of your your question? I'm sorry, I couldn't. I can. I mean, look. I mean, I can talk offline maybe later. Oh yeah, that that'll be a lot easier. I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um. Sure. Um. Is. Uh, but one more question for Junho, though. Um, I, so this person was playing Elden Ring, a new video game, and they noticed that if their character wears a headband, the facial animation does not adjust for the fact that the character has a headband. Uh, how hard is it, is it to add user-defined constraints, such as you know something blocking your face or a headband to these facial rig uh, and uh, facial rig controls? Is this something that uh, game studios might want to take into account? Yeah, so game studios, I would say it's the two, I guess, two different industries would be for games and for animations. And for animations um, like Disney, um, adding the constraints would be a lot more complicated because of the maybe the texture or the, the fabric of the actual like headband or clothing is something that they would want to simulate that's more um real to the user so i would i would think that the constraints for animation level rigs would be more tricky because they'd have to do more simulations of actual fabrics but then for game studios i think they care more about the performance first before having the whether the headband looks like deforms the way the face wants to and they're looking for more something that's more like real time so they definitely take these like shortcut approaches where Maybe just the the top of the headband is constrained to certain parts of the face, and like moving your eyebrows wouldn't actually deform the the headband. So yeah. it depends yeah. on the industry yeah. that we're looking at. That makes sense, and it's yeah, especially if they don't expect it to change that much. Why would you invest time doing this expensive uh, right. mm -hmm. thing? Um, one more question for Katya. Um, if I wanted to make an inflatable hut, like you showed in the Harvard gymnasium, but I wanted it to make very, I wanted it to be very, very big, like the size of some of those big inflatable football field type of structures. Uh, do you expect that to stop being feasible if you just take that hut and scale it very, very, very if you scale it by a lot, do you expect those modes yeah, to become uh, okay, difficult to obtain? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good point, right? I mean, uh, what is the thing? So geometry, I mean, right now our design is only based on geometry. So right now what we are working is also introduce some mechanics because if you go very large, what might happen is gravity, right? Gravity might be, the contribution of gravity might become more substantial, you know, and might play a role. So what we are currently doing is to come up with a, uh, Mechanics model where there is gravity, there are forces, right? There is gravity. There might be even, you know, if you think about the covering a roof, the wind, the snow, whatever, right? There are forces, right? That apply to the system and then quantify the energy barrier because then you know, you know, is the gravity enough to go over the energy barrier or is, you know, or are we still good? I see. Okay, so it's just a, a another. It's it's just you can reuse the same methods. It's just a slightly yeah, the different same method, type of but energy. then we need one mechanical analysis on top to verify that gravity and you know other forces that you know might be acting when we are in deployment configuration don't basically are not strong enough to pull the system over the energy barrier to go back to the mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, well, I think that that's um, all the time we have for today. Thank you very much to both of our speakers for joining us. Um, and we still have another session coming up. We've got a few more. Please join us again next week for Timea Tihani and Mohammed Ismail. Uh, so see you then. Thanks, everybody.